Before we begin, would you please take a moment to make sure that your cell phones are turned to off? Thank you. Philip Perlstein is a renowned and much admired painter who has lectured on his work at the studio school on many occasions. This time, he brings with him one of his muses. It is a pleasure indeed to welcome Mr. Perlstein back to the evening lecture series, along with the artist, poet, and model, Desiree Alvarez. How fortunate we are and how intriguing, intriguing it is to have that rare glimpse into the dialogue between the painter and the painted. Mr. Perlstein had his first one-person show in 1955 at the Tanager Gallery. Remarkably, since that time and over the course of nearly six decades, his work has been the subject of over 140 solo exhibitions. He is collected throughout the world in major public and private collections and is represented by the Betty Cunningham Gallery. So I'll turn that off. Thanks. Um, it is worth mentioning, I think, that Betty Cunningham has worked with Philip Perlstein since 1982. Philip Perlstein is a recent recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Academy of Arts and Letters, where he served as president from 2003. <laughs> special way, I guess, of thinking about uh, the model. Uh, the model would be up on the stand, and Mercedes had this collection of fabrics, which he had collected, a lot of Indian saris, I remember. And uh, the models were mostly uh, young people who were students. I don't know whether, whether from Pratt or not. Uh, and they were tired, and they would just fall asleep and in these very interesting poses, at least for 20 minutes. And at first, the pose changed every 20 minutes for the first year. Uh, I, I should add at this time that I, I was uh, probably about 38 years old. and. Uh, I had been doing graphic design before that, before I got, and that's how I got into teaching, to teach something called advertising art. Uh, and I had a degree in art history, which helped, so I gave, I was giving art history survey courses at Pratt, and uh, uh, and when I decided to take it seriously, by the way, I had been painting rocks before that. <laughs> and, and the models in Mercedes setups looked just like the rocks. That was the immediate connection. And I think it still is. <laughs> uh, I apologize to all the models. <laughs> but that, that was... Right. <laughs> right. And at any rate, that was the takeoff point. Then I began working, doing paintings from the drawings uh, that I had made in at that uh, six hour long sketch se sketching sessions on Sunday nights. That group kept meeting year after year after year in different places with changes of personnel. It went on for, I think, almost 18 years. And uh, from 6 to 12, Sunday evenings. Okay. Well, let's start there, actually. Um, how much of that do you think was about the looking, and how much of it was about the company? Well, I would say it started out probably as a social event, but we all got caught up in the seriousness of it. No, no talking was allowed. Uh, while you were drawing, and it was impolite to look at anybody else's work. So you've really broken that rule in your own studio because you do talk while you paint. Well, not too often. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> try to discourage you. One of the things that was so amazing to me about looking for you was how you were able to articulate these really rather brilliant thoughts while you would be fully working, fully immersed in working. I, I don't know how you were able to do that. <laughs> oh, now that you mention it, I don't either. But I, I have to say, uh, a film, a video, whatever, was done uh, 
on me about five or six years ago. And they kept shooting, you know. You never know what's going to end up in the film. And at one point, Desiree and I started a conversation, or Desiree started it, while I was painting away. Uh, and she said, do you think that you've substituted portraiture for storytelling? I think that's the way you say it. Portraiture for me. Yeah. For me. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the answer was yes. <laughs> Even though the paintings look like there's some strange thing happening, uh, it's really just about the visual experience, my visual experience in painting it. And that's the subject. And everything that's there is just to make it more interesting to look at. Essentially, I believe painting is a purely visual experience, not a literary one. And uh, most people want, want to read the storyline or to get some kind of, uh, I guess, emotional reaction to the work. And uh, I never was in interested in that. I, uh, even when I studied art history, it was because I wanted to look at all those slides. I liked the images. I didn't care what it, an Egyptian relief meant. I loved the shapes and the way they interacted. Uh, the same thing would be true of you know, Renaissance art. Uh, but the school I went to, unfortunately, emphasized meaning, iconography. And none of the instructors, instructors, as far as I could tell, were interested in how the painting was put together, in, I guess in an architectural sense, as I, as I thought about it. But in terms of the meaning and the figure, can you talk about then why the figure? Why are you painting the figure about these years? And, and how has that meaning or your relationship with the figure changed over the last 50 years or, or not changed? I don't think it has changed. You're still a rock. <laughs> 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 uh, and in a hard place. <laughs> but I, I, I more or less grew up in art schools and working from the figure was always there. And in a sense, uh, when I began teaching uh, at Pratt Institute, uh, and I was given a figure drawing course to teach, I um, more or less took it as a, mm, but let's say that pop art was developing at the time, or was just beginning to emerge. And maybe I saw the figure, the model in the studio situation as another variation on uh, pop art. You weren't a Coke bottle. You were a rock. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, there's a sadness to a pop, but most of the iconography of pop art, it's, it's, it's very sad. And I, I, I just like the choice of the figure because it's so, so fluid and ever changing and a lot. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, the figure is a fascinating object to look at, and it's. Uh, a party for the eyes. <laughs> everything keeps changing, and everything keeps changing. Um, there, there's a new issue of the uh, Metropolitan Museum, that book they send out a couple times a year. The new one's on anatomy as, uh, as it was started by art, as it was taken by artists. Uh, starting in the, what, the 13th or 14th century and developed to its highest level by, you know, Michelangelo and uh, da Vinci and so forth. And it's very interesting, the article is. Uh, and it made a point that I think is really very relevant uh, to me, 
Da Vinci was interested in what the mechanics of the body, how the muscles work, and they all did dissections uh, against the church, against you know the law and so on, but it was done in secret, but very uh, intensely. And uh, the Da Vinci was interested in all the mechanics and how the blood circulate and all that sort of thing. Michelangelo was only interested in the surface and how the muscles uh, influence the surface. I thought that was an interesting point. And uh, it's how I felt about the body. I don't want to know what's going on under the skin. Uh, I'm squeamish. And, uh, <laughs> I think a big part of it for you is the you know, the relationship between looking in the moment and I feel like that is what I'm able to keep working in this place of what we hear is saying where you're seeing the situations. Yeah. I mean, I was picking slides to, to look at and talk about tonight. I was going to start realizing it almost didn't matter which one I picked because they're all amazing and they're all, they're all, Almost a million dollars of of your relationship to perception. Well, that's as I said. It's all been a, a, a for me a very intense uh, visual experience. Uh, it's something else in my background. I have to. I'd like to mention. I uh, I've had two episodes of blindness. Uh, one occurred in Italy during World War II, uh, not in combat, but I was always in training for combat. Uh, one night we were sort of creeping along some little river uh, at the base of Monte Cassino. This was a training uh, event, not, not combat. And suddenly all these explosions started going off. And right beside me, a great big phosphorus bomb went off. And there was this blinding light, and then I couldn't see. Uh, so I sat down and waited till some medics came along, and they led me back to the uh, medical camp uh, tent. And I waited my turn. People in these training programs were always getting wounded. Uh, I mean, they were done with the real uh, ammunition. Uh, and uh, anyway, I, I was sitting there thinking, well, okay, now I'm blind. <laughs> and then uh, the, the doctor finally got around to me. And he, he took my glasses off, and I could see. <laughs> the glasses had been splattered with mud. Uh, <laughs> But those, those, that, that couple of hours of waiting and being blinded was, was really one of the most intense experiences I had during World War II. Uh, then again, years later, we, my wife and I were in Rome. I had a Fulbright Fellowship. We had a, a baby there. And uh, every morning I had to turn on what was called the Skull de Banya. Uh, for hot water. I lit a match, turned on the gas, and this thing would light. Well, one morning, it exploded in my face. Uh, this was about 15 years later. Anyway, it exploded in my face, and uh, I was blind. I couldn't see. And Dorothy called the Fulbright office, and a doctor came within a within an hour, and he said, the uh, skin, I didn't know we had skin over the eyeball, had been toasted, and that it would uh, clear up. I just had to sit in a dark room for about a week and a half. So that was another blind experience. And at the end of it, 
there was this great feeling of joy that I could see. So I've always thought that just seeing was one of the great uh, gifts of being alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm painting, I have to get fully immersed in every detail as I go along. And if, if the model isn't there and I'm just painting that pattern on the floor, it doesn't look the same. I can't do it. Um, Desiree had to be sitting there in the middle of those uh, horses. And the, the dirigible, by, by the way, was a, uh, had been a, a weather vane when it was young. Should I scroll through some Right, things? okay. Okay, this looks like it's loaded with meaning. <laughs> but, but it wasn't <laughs> on my part. Uh, a friend from Italy uh, had been through the big antique show on the, uh, on the piers, which they have. And he bought this birdhouse, which was, uh, obviously had been a model of the White House at one point, but somebody had cut holes into it for the birds and had, it had been outside and used as a bird's nest because it was full of straw and in little inside. And uh, he was staying with us on his way back to Italy, and I insisted that he leave this with me. Uh, it just looked like such a great challenge. I mean, how could you build a painting around an object that's so klutzy in a way? And uh, well, it looks like, I guess it was loaded with meaning that I wanted to ignore. I took it as a challenge. You always do seem to be really attracted to these, these um, objects that are often essentially American. Yeah. <laughs> well, because, because when I studied art history at NYU, it was all about. Uh, I guess most, mostly uh, religion. I know much more about uh, the Egyptian religion and the Catholic religion than I ever did about the Jewish religion. Uh, and, and that's what it was all about there, learning all the, what everything meant. And I just, when I started for, that was before I ever thought I'd end up as a realist artist, working with uh, definable subject matter. And uh, I decided I'd totally ignore meaning, because I had decided there's no way it can be controlled. Even all those Catholic symbol, symbolisms from the Renaissance, people had, had to put out a great deal of effort to study them, to interpret them. It just isn't any casual observer who, who gets the meanings. It's the specialist. So I decided to ignore all of that <laughs> and just take things as, they, as I saw them. Uh, incidentally, in an effort to uh, make it not look like a dream or a surrealist vision, I spent as much time painting that electric outlet on the wall <laughs> as I did the model's face. It was even harder to make convincing. <laughs> I, I, what I did was I sort of skipped over the first time. I took two from the 70s, two from the period of my work for you in the 90s, and then two from now. And somehow it's the first two, but now we're into the now, so this is like a sneak preview. Um, so we're going to be Right, uh, this is, a, uh, it was finished just this past few months. Uh, by the way, the, pa the size of the paintings, are, they're all fairly large. This one, I think, is uh, about five feet high, four feet wide. And, uh, I had been sent a plastic chair 
by uh, a young man who had worked as a, been in my studio for a long time as just to help. Uh, he got credit for it. He, he was going through the, uh, the art department of the new school and he was uh, the son of a friend of the family. And then he moved off to Los, Los Angeles and he saw this plastic chair, inflatable chair on sale at the local museum. And he sent, sent it to me for Christmas. And uh, there's another one. And I've done a series of paintings with it. The chair had to be replaced a couple of times because <laughs> they, def they suffer damage very easily and deflate. But what intrigued me about it is, it, again, this is an art history connection. It reminded me of those little figures in bubbles floating off in Anonymous Bosch paintings. Uh, it also produces all kinds of weird distortions, and very often they look, uh, oh, suddenly I can't think of his name, the English artist with the great, who? Freud? English and Freud? Oh, Bacon. Yeah. Francis Bacon. Yeah, Francis Bacon. <laughs> you get really wild distortions. Not you don't see it in this one necessarily. Right. 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 <laughs> and, uh, I should say that that big piece of fabric was also sent to me as a gift uh, by somebody who had. Stay, stayed in the, you know, he'd been a house guest for a week or so, and he sent that as a gift. Right. You know, most of the time that the model is there, of course, I'm working on all those other little extraneous details. I, there was another influence I'd like to mention. Uh, I did read a lot of Gertrude Stein's works, and there was one one passage that she wrote about. Um, I forget I forget what the name what the name of the work is, but she said she it was uh, she had torn up a bunch of words from magazines and had just put them in a paper bag and shook them up and wrote them down in the order in which she took them out of the bag, giving equal, I mean, thereby giving equal emphasis to each word. And I decided early on I'd do that with each detail in the painting, make everything as equally important, uh, which is an odd thing to do. But each of those little flower designs and the little wrinkles are all as exact portraits of that little flower or wrinkle on the fabric as I could make it, as the portrait of the model. Uh, do you think it, that's very democratic in America, or, or do you have a more like, like, to it, but it's the famous of the thing or the essence of all things? Well, I don't know, but it's given me a great deal of respect for the uh, I guess so-called peasant women who knit, who wove these things. <laughs> I find them enormously complex once I get involved with them, and uh, just as difficult to paint as any part of the body. Yeah, that actually makes me want to talk a little bit about 
photography and um, the material is so extraordinary because we're looking at an image of a painting of queer and recognizable images. And the time that it took me rendering the detail, the texture, the reflections, the different qualities of the surface area between skin, let's say, and rug. Um, we just just not there when we took the photograph in the same way. Well, uh, cameras have improved in the last 20 or 30 years compared to what they were uh, when I was growing up, let's say. Uh, the, uh, and, and the best of the new cameras scan the subject line by line, you know, yes. like a TV camera. You get absolute... Uh, but we're not looking at the, the time of the artist's time and not the coordination. Well, well uh, the traditional cameras, I mean the older cameras, not the electronic ones, uh, had worked by what we call field of vision. There, there was one point in the whatever you're looking at that could be an absolute focus and everything else fell away. And some of the older cameras actually, you know, gave you uh, the ability to, to pick out that point of focus in, the, in what the subject in front of you. And you could play around with it uh, and change where that point was. But uh, the new cameras don't do that. And they are flat. And there is a flatness to them that the old cameras uh, didn't have as a result. But in a way, I anticipated that in my, as I got more and more involved in painting from life, by, you know, deciding every little bit of the painting, every detail has to be in, as important, therefore in sharp focus. And so everything in the painting is in the, the same degree of focus. However, I use bristle brushes. Uh, sable brushes lead to, to a kind of slickness that I'm a little wary of, simply because I developed during the abstract expressionist era when everybody loved brush strokes. And uh, so I've never given up my bristle brushes. I keep uh, throwing them away as soon as they get worn. <laughs> oh, right. But uh, you fight with it to get to get that sharpness. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, during World War II, uh, I was lucky to be in Italy, and as I said, not to be in combat. But I kept taking training to be in combat. But uh, it was very interesting that during, while the fighting was on, the British had a group of art historians. And every time a, a small town was taken over, the English art historians would put together an exhibition of the work that had been put a, hidden away for safekeeping. And they would write little, uh, booklets, which in English, which were mimeographed, and I still have several of them. Uh, then finally, I, I spent uh, several months taking training outside of Rome, after Rome became an open city. Uh, I was in this big training camp uh, out there. Rome used to be a much smaller city than it is now. When you went past St. Saint Paul's outside the wall, that's where the city ended. Now it goes on forever. Uh, in all directions, the same thing. But uh, the army base ran trucks in to the city every night and weekends on a regular kind of schedule. And so whenever I could, I would go into town. And weekends especially uh, 
were wonderful Saturdays and Sundays because, again, the English and the Italians uh, put on these wonderful shows of, of paintings that had been stored away for safekeeping. And, and I saw this, uh, I saw all kinds of paintings. Uh, they were distributed quite differently than they are now, these shows. Uh, at any rate, the, uh, the painting that most impressed me during that period what was this portrait of Velasquez, uh, Pope Innocent X. Uh, uh, it was, uh, I mean, there was all those Michelangelos and Raphaels and all that, but it was before they had been cleaned. And they were kind of dim and fuzzy to look at. <laughs> uh, Tintorettos were black. Uh, you couldn't see anything. The same thing with most, true of most of the Titians. For some reason or other, the Velasquez had escaped getting that kind of coat of varnish that turned black. And it was wonderful. And uh, what amazed me about it was that it looked so much like this man was really sitting there in that chair right in front of me. I have to stress that there were no... There was no electric, uh, electric lights. Uh, you saw these works then in a very dim room, uh, like late afternoon light, and which might have helped the illusion uh, of the lights popping forward. But he really looked like he was sitting in that chair, uh, a real person sitting in that chair. And it was down low enough that I was face to face with him. Uh, well, at that point, I was everybody was doing realism, uh, American realism, American painting uh, before World War II. Uh, in a way, it was very provincial. Uh, Abstraction was frowned on. It was politically incorrect. The abstractionists were thought of as Bolsheviks, uh, un-American. And what was pushed officially was American scene painting, uh, which varied like, you know, from, uh, oh, what's his name, who made the El Greco-like realist paintings to uh, Reginald Marsh and so on, but it, it, it was realism, uh, and that's what I grew up in, and that's what I had been doing. And in the army, I had kept my sanity by making drawings at the end of every day of sketches that I had started during the day, and uh, and doing watercolors on weekends. I was able to do it. It's amazing. Uh, I have the, I still have this collection of work, but I was involved in realism, and the Velasquez just was the epitome of everything I'd been trying to do. It still is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that mm -hmm. one painting. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay, this is a portrait of Chuck Close as a relatively young man, and this was before. Uh, he became paraplegic. Uh, this is Andy Warhol, who, for better or for worse, was part of my life story. Um, I met Andy when I went back to college on the GI Bill as a sophomore, and he was in the class. Most of us in the class were on the GI Bill, and there were a few a couple of young men and a, and a few young ladies who were the right age. A Andy was one of them, and he uh, was attracted to me, as somebody explained to me years later, because I had been talked about as being famous. When, when I'd been hi in high school, I had won National Scholastic High School Contest, and 
Life magazine, which was the great cultural institution at the time, had uh, written up that show of National Scholastic High School art that year and had reproduced the work of, I don't know, about 12 or 15 of these young artists. And I had won two first prizes, one in oil, one in watercolor. And they were both reproduced big. <laughs> Everybody else was small. But it made me uh, a local hero for a few, a few days. Right, right. Well, let's go back to Andy, though, for a minute. And uh, so Andy, shortly after we were, I met him or started talking to him, uh, said, how does it feel to be famous? And I said, well, it only lasted 15 minutes. I, I, I'm sorry, not 15 minutes. I said it only lasted five minutes. He changed it later to 15. <laughs> but that's the beginning of that story. <laughs> then he and I came to New York together when we graduated and uh, shared a, a space. Um, he immediately became very successful as an illustrator. I wanted to be an art director, <laughs> the one who gave out the jobs. Uh, at any rate, this was taken during the uh, a hot summer when we first came to New York in 1949. Uh, posing him in front of that, the American flag was, uh, I mean, this was long before pop art, but I thought it was a nice idea at the time, at the moment. And he photographed me against a barber pole but I, I can't find that photograph. <laughs> There's another one may have, of me posing in front of a floor shop, which isn't nearly as interesting, that he took. Okay. And this is Robert Rosenblum, who was a fellow student of art history when I went to NYU Institute of Fine Arts, and that was on the GI Bill as well. Uh, I was working as an assistant to a graphic designer at that point, and he's the one who encouraged me to go back, since I had time on the GI Bill, to study art history. Because he, he was then teaching at uh, Pratt Institute, and he said, American art students are very badly educated. They just want the bubbles without the problem of going th through making the champagne. <laughs> uh, so I went to NYU Institute of Fine Arts, and Robert was a, uh, a fellow student at the time. So was L Leo Steinberg. But they were on their, on their uh, uh, doctorates, working towards their doctorates, and I was just starting on my master's degree. Uh, this, this is, yeah. Right. Right. Well, this is, uh, Cis uh, where was it? Sardinia. Um, oh, wait, you're going too fast. Right. Okay. Where, where are we going now? Okay. Well, this is, these are rocks in Sicily, which I did much later, after working with uh, the models for years and doing my best to be a realist. I, I should say that during the 1950s, I did my best to be an abstract expressionist painter. Um, and as I, I ended up painting rocks because I needed something to look at, and uh, the rocks looked abstract enough, and they, I discovered they had kind of a, a lot of them had a neurotic look to them, <laughs> like they'd had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> so I, I 
when I went back to Italy several times, I've done landscapes there just to see what would happen with all this new experience I've had as a realist. And uh, I must say the rocks there are the most neurotic looking rocks I've ever come across. Uh, <laughs> Right. Right. But there's something missing, and that is it's not authentically neurotic. At, at a certain point in the late 1950s, I uh, realized that, you know, everybody was working away very expressionistically. Uh, and I realized later that a lot of so-called gener uh, second generation abstract expressionists had been through World War II, almost everybody. And uh, a lot of them had had pretty horrific experiences, which was never talked about. Uh, nobody, as far as I can remember, once mentioned being in the, except as a joke maybe, being in the Army. I knew Irving had been, Irving Sandler had been in the Marines, but that's about all that was ever said. But a lot of people had really been uh, through combat and so forth, and uh, had all these terrible experiences. And expressionist painting is a wonderful way out. But by, let's say, 1958, I had worked my way through it. And I realized I was faking the expressionist element at that point. And uh, that's why getting involved in realism and objectivity uh, was a real effort on my point. Because mm -hmm. I thought it was almost hypocritical yeah. to go on trying to be, uh, to act as, at least in front of the easel as if I were having a nervous breakdown. I wasn't. I wanted to go back to one of the portraits. I want to go back to him. Yeah. Okay. This, this is Erwin Panofsky, who was the head of NYU. Not the head. He was the main figure at the time at NYU Institute of Fine Arts. And he's the man who more or less invented the whole field of modern iconography by saying you don't understand the civilization without standing, uh, without studying it's the art it produced. And you can't understand the art without studying the civilization. Uh, and so he was responsible for everybody studying meaning, symbolism, iconography. At a certain point, uh, somebody who had also been a fellow student, Irving, 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 Irving Laven, uh, called me and said they were doing, they were honoring uh, Panofsky's 100th birthday, and would I do a portrait that would be used uh, as a poster? And I said, he's dead, and I don't work from photographs. And Irving said, it's time you started. <laughs> and so he sent me a bunch of photographs, most of which looked very artificial. And the only one that looked, made him look human was taken by uh, one of his grandchildren with obviously a little brownie with a flash. So I chose that one, and uh, I made a slide of it. And then I projected it. I don't know how a real photorealist worked, but this was my solution. I uh, hung, I projected on it onto the wall in front of me, and painted as if he were really sitting there. The 
hand, the hand was out of focus. That's my hand. That was done from life. But, but, but I decided he's the one I've been fighting all those years about subject matter. And so after that, after I did that portrait, I went all out putting in all these other kinds of objects uh, just to, I guess it was my own kind of nastiness. I decided I was setting up puzzles for future young art historians. <laughs> <laughs> Such as this. Yeah, so then uh, I think, well, I also have put in some of what I like to think of as the anti portraits. Um, and some of where, where yeah, I That's the days of Ray. And then this one, yeah, I think it's Kiko. Uh, yeah, that's. Portraits are distant and um, people are at the same time as they're supported, and then of course there's the whole emotional you know, thing. Right. It, by the way, it, it is a uh, weather vane, the kind yeah. called the whirly gig. Which is so American. Even the yeah. word is American. You, you don't find them in Europe. Um, at any rate, uh, it was my non portrait painting. Yeah. yeah. And, and then when I was um, looking through your slides, so we were both looking for the little last slide, and, um, and in this little box of 35 millimeter slides, I saw this detail, which I thought was one of her paintings. It was a torso with a hand on it. And I thought, oh my God, what is that painting? I don't know that painting. And I pulled it out to look at it more closely, not realizing that it was the like, detail of the very close back to the Medusa that you had listened to taken when you were, uh, I don't know when you took it, but, yeah. but I was so intrigued by the fact that the way you photograph details is essentially the way you paint as well, the way you make compositions. It was, um, that great, it? Right. And when I was modeling for you in the 90s, I felt like you were doing a series of what I call disaster paintings. So right. I have a few of them here. They're fake disasters. Uh, some students at Brooklyn had, who were living in a rooming house found a group of these model airplanes up in the attic of the, room, of the house they were in, and nobody claimed them. So they brought the biggest one to my studio just to store it. In the meantime, I moved from one from that studio into a bigger one. And during the move, uh, this got wrecked, this big airplane model got wrecked in the uh, moving van. But I liked it better when it was wrecked somehow. Then there's also a kitty car that somebody built. It's a homemade thing in the shape of a little airplane. So I put them together and added the models. <laughs> Uh, a disaster in my studio. Mm -hmm. So, and then, and then there are also so many paintings with couples. Um, I mean, I feel like we we can't we can't not be here together today and, and not talk about um, you know the notion of painting naked couples in a wrecked scene like this. Um, yeah. Well. Uh, all the models I've worked with have been healthy, <laughs> in good physical condition, and I've never pretended otherwise. Um, I never wanted the models to look like they were having nervous breakdowns, or you just cut their heads off. Or were de decomposing. <laughs> well, the heads are sort of unnecessary in terms of composition. <laughs> Unless I'm doing a portrait uh, where you're more or less obliged to have the head. But I, I start the composition somewhere in the middle where things overlap and just let it grow out. I usually work with charcoal on the canvas directly. And where it ends around the edges, it ends. Uh, it's too bad James's head went off. 
bad for games. Yeah. He, he was a handsome young man. <laughs> <laughs> but no one would ever know it from this painting. <laughs> the one thing I've been concerned with in a very superficial way uh, was body language. I'm not an expert in it, but I didn't want anything to look like it was suggesting something. Well, uh, I do think the thing that is so often suggested to people and critics is, is the notion of boredom. And, and it is so often remarked that the models are sitting there and they look so bored, and Sister Wendy has said that, of course, they're bored. They've been sitting there for six hours. They're exhausted and yeah. bored. And, you know, there's, there's the sense of um, the models are waiting for Godot uh, or... Um, I, I'm always reminded with your paintings of the, the great Pascal quote that, that goes something like, uh, man's, all of man's troubles arise from his difficulty sitting quietly alone in a room. Well, but you admit you were bored. Well, I, I'm never <laughs> bored. <laughs> Anyway, boredom is part of the subject, I guess. Well, I, I, think, I think we're projecting the boredom on it. I mean, I think we look at those scenes and we think, well, what are those people doing there? I mean, if they're not, you know, passionately embracing or they're not um, holding a globe or uh, uh, a book or doing any of the, 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 the things that are the iconography of paintings about, you know, wise people or... Um, then I think we do. We look. We put our. I think. I think we put ourselves in them. You know. I mean, when I when I was writing about your work more recently, I suddenly had this completely different take on it, which was that it's just incredibly intimate work. I mean, it it it's what people look like when they've been sitting their entire lives together, maybe. And they know each other so well, they have nothing left to say. <laughs> uh, and I wonder, you know, I mean, I think that you, having your models sit there for six hours and you're painting them, I mean, it, it's, it's this amazing metaphor, really, of what, how do we spend our lives? Uh, in your case, it's this extraordinary apprenticeship to craft. Well, you're... you're, you're lying there bored, but I'm working very hard <laughs> to register that. Uh, a lot of people have thought that the uh, closing the eyes suggests that the people are dead. And uh, I never really thought that, but I can understand it. Uh, one, one other point I'd like to make is that the Jericho painting we just saw, probably, uh, I don't know if that fits into academicism or the academic way of building a figure. I don't think it could uh, because it's obviously painted directly. A lot of those figures were painted directly from life. And... Uh, there were a couple of young artists who did pose for this. Uh, what's his name? The one right in the center. You just see his back. Uh, another great artist of the early 19th century. Not Delacroix? Who? Delacroix? No? No? Try again. <laughs> Oh, anyway, forget it. Anyway, he wrote about it. Oh, Delacroix. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, you said, no, no. okay. Del Delacroix in his diaries actually writes about the experience of posing for it. He doesn't say which figure he posed for. And some speculation that I read was that it was that one uh, where you don't see much anatomy, just the shoulders. I'd rather think it was one of these two young men hanging off the edge. But they are obviously not done according to any academic rule. They're, they could only be done from uh, looking at people 
in those positions because they're too specific. Academicism involves, well, it's based on kind of a abstraction, uh, a series of rules that, that usually have to be that have to be followed if you're going to be a real academician. And every once in a while, I do have kind of a fantasy of somebody like Angra saying, Oi, Vey Perlstein, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said that you think of the positioning of the objects in your paintings and the limbs of the models as, in some abstract manner, mimicking the the gestures of abstract expressionism, you know, whether it's Kooning, Franz Klein. But I, which I think is marvelous, and I'm also thinking that you're also quoting these old master paintings in terms of the way that, or, or not necessarily quoting, but I mean, there's a there's a related dialogue going on in terms of you figured out your own way of having arms up in the air and legs strewn diagonally across the compositional field. Well, I, I do want to point out that I, my basic ideas about composition are, were very strongly influenced during the 1950s um, by the three painters who were my favorite among the, uh, that generation, uh, generally called abstract expressionists, that would be a, de Kooning, Franz Klein, and Philip Guston. And I think you can see echoes of their compositional devices in these. But it has to do with the, uh, the structure of the painting, the, the layout, the, almost the architecture. And there is a three-dimensional element implied. Uh, so there's a frontal view, a side view, and a view from above that I do think of while I'm developing the composition uh, in terms of the spatial implications or spatial design, which happens spontaneously while I'm building up the, uh, the image on the canvas. Uh, I, I, I guess everybody goes through that. Uh, that first phase, which is the most exciting, trying to find, you find the image on the canvas. You, it, it almost happens by itself sometimes. Tell that to my missing head in this painting. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you feel like the, the objects, the acquisition of objects, because you have this amazing collection, which I'll try to find, well, there's a, there's a swan. I wanted just to talk a little bit about the animals and, and the objects in general and the, the, the way I feel like you, you've expa you expand, you're able to expand your repertoire of form into an area of stylization that the figure doesn't afford you as a realist painter. And so I'm wondering about how the objects, the collectibles have... Well, most of the objects that I've picked have a very interesting structure themselves, or a strong silhouette, clearly defined in a way that I like it, uh, to look at it. Um, the swan happens to be a, just a terrific piece of wood carving, sculpture, and from the early 19th century. So it has a nice patina, and uh, of course, there are overtones that I recognize. You know, it's lead later than the swan is inescapable. I, I collected a lot of these things long before I ever thought of using them in paintings. And I started using them in paintings, as I said, partly in response to doing that portrait of Panofsky, uh, where I do something like this just in defiance. <laughs> It is isn't dark. Again, the anti-romantic non-meaning? Right, and anti-mythology. Mm -hmm. Anti-mythology. It's just a chunk of wood 
and this young lady is, uh, has her leg over it. And uh, so a, a folding metal ladder is holding up the swan. That's what the painting's about. I mean, so, in terms of subject matter. So then what's, what, what is mythic becomes the act of painting. Well, for me, because I don't think anybody can control the reaction, the intellectual reaction of anybody who looks at a painting, uh, other than putting a title on it. But uh, it's always up for grabs. I mean, whoever looks at the painting uh, makes it their own in terms of what the painting means to them. And all the artist can do, I think, is make the best, best painting he can out of whatever he decides are his aims as a painter. Do you have any associations with vulnerability from the, the nude figure? Associations what? Of vulnerability. I was thinking about what you were saying earlier in terms of your war experiences and not wanting to paint, uh, not wanting to fake emotions. Or, yeah. And now I'm wondering about your, about what is it, what is the figure for you in terms of that, in terms of vulnerability or in terms of non-vulnerability? Is it just a figure? Well, I think, I don't know, I can only speak in terms of myself again. I don't think anybody or that many artists through the history of art have really looked at knuckles or knees or ankles. I mean, you get it to a great extent in that Delacroix, but almost no other art, unless they're doing a direct study of a model as an exercise. But almost any painting by an artist like Ong, all those things are sloughed off and sloughed over. All those little lumps and bumps and uh, veins repel a lot of people, even though they're on the surface and not under the skin where they would upset me. Uh, and I recognize it's a, a barrier. A lot of people can't uh, stand looking at them, I think. It makes them nervous. Is it ever your hope that we need <coughs> to see the figure then as abstract, purely? I don't think, I think the figure is, uh, its movements are abstract but the uh, individual items are too specific. I mean, toes are toes no matter what you do. If you're exposing them, you know, they have knuckles and toenails and all those unpleasant things. And you're, I'm stuck with it. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think a lot of people who I know that in that drawing group I referred to originally in Mercedes' uh, studio, uh, those were things nobody wanted to deal with or to look at. And uh, the first sense of prejudice I ever felt against me as a realist came from that, in, within that group. Uh, I was told I was doing the wrong thing. Uh, by emphasizing those elements. But uh, maybe that's why I persisted and why the knees and the uh, ankles and the hip joints and the so forth uh, get, get as clear as I can make them no matter what they look like. And they always look different and unexpected, they, and they don't correspond to what they, you want them to look like. The knees, knee bones take on personalities of some sort. Is, is, is there a sense in which you ever think about truth? About what? Truth. Truth? Yeah, I mean, I, I find I'm thinking about truth as you're talking. No, no, it's just visual truth. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. yeah. For me, it's not a moral issue. No, 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 I meant, I meant that, yeah, yeah. 
and it's not a political issue. But there, there was a point, by the way, uh, when Alfred Leslie was, and I were more or less uh, trying to do the same kind of painting. Uh, we were almost thought of as twins <laughs> at one point and getting and people were confusing us. Uh, but it was right at that moment when, when uh, all the early uh, protests, protesters were taking place and we were both thought of as saying it, whatever that phrase was, saying it like it is rather than making it look nice. Uh, and we, our, our work was finding uh, acceptance among young college people. Mm -hmm. It didn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they were seen as symbols for truth. Well, I'd apologize to the models, <laughs> several of whom are here. Wow. <laughs> well, three. No, none of the men are here. <laughs> By the way, James's head is very much in this painting. <laughs> <laughs> So is the electric outlet. I always said you were very What year is that? I'm going to guess that's. No, that's not. And that's maybe early 1993? I think it's in the late 1980s. It's uh, 1992. It's later than I thought. So your love of animals, can we go back to that for a minute? Well, uh, they're almost as interesting as people, except they, they, they're covered with fur. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, these are... Uh, Especially interesting, this, this pair of lines, which were carved out of mahogany, and when I bought them, I was told they were from the uh, uh, from Coney Island, 
from Luna Park. Luna Park was the first section there to have so much electricity involved, uh, the number of electric lights and so forth uh, exceeded anything before. And uh, Japanese workmen were brought over to do all the work, including carving all these animals, a lot of which were just ornamental. These were not from a carousel. Uh, I don't know how they were used. But the place burnt down around 1902, I think. And uh, somebody rescued all these animals. And I saw a warehouse room full of them once on Atlantic Avenue. I've tried to find that place again and can't. But I, my son spotted these, one of them, in a window at one of the antique stores and said he thought I should go look. And I went and the man took me upstairs, the owner, and it was incredible. It was filled with all these elephants and giraffes and camels, all life-size. These were the only small ones. And uh, he drove them home for me <laughs> in, into Manhattan. But uh, so they have that, for me, interesting history. And they do look Japanese. They look like the faces have that Japanese guardian spirit look that you find of sculptures in front of their temples. Oh yeah, uh, right. And the rug is from a different culture, the Middle East somewhere. The electric light represents our our culture, and so do you. And uh, I've always done these paintings under electric light, by the way. And the electric light and the shadows have become part of uh, the subject matter. I almost said iconography. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, if there is any iconography or meaning, it's that New York City is one big flea market. <laughs> And I've been doing my best to uh, bring some of it home. Well, I mean, in that sense, it's, it's the work is very global. Yeah, but it's not about the human condition. I want to emphasize that. The, the human condition, in my experience, has been OK. <laughs> it continues to be OK. I, I realize that that's threatening looking. <laughs> and and that gave the two of you problems crawling under that all the time. Every time you took a break, you had to get back under that object, which was also a weather vane. Uh, here, iconography did play a little role. The balloon was something I think you gave me for Christmas, and you bought it in the Boston Museum mm -hmm. gift shop. It's a balloon in the shape of a, a mummy, but it has all the correct iconography on it, and I painted it very carefully, reproducing it. I think it's the most religious object I've ever painted. <laughs> uh, the figure of Punch is a hand puppet from the 19th century. Wait, is that Punch or Popeye? Oh, that's Popeye, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's Popeye. It's a little stuffed doll from the 1930s on a, a toy fire engine with the ladder going up. Uh, I would like an interpretation, <laughs> if 
if anyone has one. Well, there's so there's, 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 um, religion, really, 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 really. Yeah. I mean, the God is ultimately not to like something you can't. I had a lot of trouble with the the hair on the chest. <laughs> There, there was a point at which uh, I, I pointed out to him uh, that his hairline was like Mickey Mouse's, and he shaved all his hair off the next week. <laughs> Not in this painting, another one. No, that was the White House painting. Okay, next. Do we want to take questions people? Okay. By the way, that's that's a, a figure from a carnival. I mean, the Mickey Mouse, and he's on a unicycle. And I'm sure he was originally on a treadmill, and his legs moved, and his arms with the symbols moved up and down. But it's hardly the Disney cute. I mean, it's from Disney, obviously. But it's not the cute version of Disney. He's rather nasty looking. Yep. Please wait for the microphone for the question. Irving. <laughs> Playing the music was largely, I mean, it became a matter of it's useful as a keeping time, uh, but also keeps down conversation, even though Desiree says I talk a lot <laughs> while working. Fewer records then. <laughs> There's a behind you. I, I remember at, at one time you didn't use objects with your figures. You just did the figures. Uh, when did that change? When did you start yeah. adding figures to the? Uh, well, it, it changed when I moved from a relatively uh, small space into a, a great big space. Uh, which was about 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. And I, had, I was teaching then at Brooklyn College, and I hired a group of the fellows who were uh, students in the master's program, Master of Arts, they were all artists, to help me make the move. My studio, pre the old studio was up four flights of steps, and it took all day to bring everything down, put it in the truck, and it took all evening to get them back up into the new space, even though the new building had an elevator. Um, we ended at about midnight. By that time, they were tired, and they just dumped everything, all these objects, which I had collected over the years. They collected, uh, dumped them down into uh, clusters. And the next day when I was there by myself, I know the clusters were really interesting, the way the objects juxt uh, juxtaposed one against the other. 
So I just began adding the models, recreating the clusters in the working space and adding the models. And very often, the models would pick out objects to pose with as well. Uh, it's kind of a source of entertainment. Uh, another secret of my background. I uh, spent a year working at the old Life magazine in its heyday, around 1956, before television took over, and uh, doing layout, uh, the, the news items. And the editors would decide what stories they were going to emphasize and what the pictures were going to be and what the layout should be. But they gave you three or four alternatives. And the original photographs had to be marked up with a percentage in terms of size. And you would send them down to the in-house photostat place. And you'd get this stack of the same photograph back uh, in different sizes. And then the layouts you would crop them to fit the editor's ideas in three or four different ways. It wasn't the cropping that uh, what was left, but what the editor that I found interesting, but what they decided was unimportant uh, that fascinated me. And if I'd been smart, I would have then started making paintings of the parts that were thrown away, just around the edges. Somebody else beat me to it with abstract painting, uh, just painting the abstractions around the edges and leaving the center rectangle blank. Uh, at that time, I was painting abstractly, so I wasn't interested in the uh, imagery and what I don't do with my own work is crop. I start in the middle and let it grow out from the center. But where it happens to end around the edge gets cropped out there. Uh, I guess I did carry that over from those days of, mm -hmm. of boredom at Life magazine. <laughs> Please wait for the microphone. Yes. Um, do you think the way you depicted the nudes changed in any systematic way when you started to add these objects? Well, no, I treated the objects as equals of the, the models. So for me, there wasn't a technical change. There was a greater challenge because there were so many more textures involved. And I didn't want to get involved with heavy paint, because heavy paint gets in the way of what I was trying to do, which was constantly modulate things. And I keep going over and over and over the same area, because that area keeps changing the way it looks. And what I finally end up with is the last time I went over it, which is sometimes after five or six passes at it an accumulation. They go on over a period of months. A way that I mean it emphasizes the depth if we look at it as a depth perception exercise, but it it breaks it into separate sections if we look at it flat as an abstract painting. Right. But I, I, I also should mention that I taught for a long time, uh, just about 30 years. And I had a lot of very terrific students during those years. And I would give problems uh, anticipating a certain kind of result. 
uh, I, in other words, I was using the classroom as a laboratory to see what they would come up, what solutions they would come up with. And I learned a lot from looking at the results of their work. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with uh, composition and, and focus and what you decide. Uh, you know, just deciding what it is that you're looking at can be very difficult because things keep changing. And it's hard to nail it down uh, exactly the transition between uh, the armpit and the breast. Uh, is a, a very tricky area, and uh, partly because it keeps changing. The face remains relatively static, except if you're, the person's talking, and I never let anybody talk or smile in my paintings. <laughs> You're interested in the structure, um, and yet you say you start in the center and you just work out and it ends up being what it is. Right, well there's a difference between setting up the composition and then focusing on realizing each detail as I go along. Well, I the, uh, the setting it up, of it up is, is more or less an intellectual experience in terms of what's happening uh, in terms of the picture organization, not in terms of the meaning. Are uh, you still using a camera to, to look at composition before you? I'm sorry? Are you still use, working with a camera at all for compositions? There was a period of time when I know you were taking quick frames with a video still camera. Uh, I'm not I can't quite hear. Oh, are you still taking quick video still photographs before you embark on the paintings? No, I, the work never comes from photographs or, or videos. You I've always used, met the composition when you were playing with... The digital camera? Yeah. Well, no, I've used it mainly to... Uh, Well, I use it now mainly to find, uh, to help find a composition um, because everything changes so much as I move from one point to another. You end up with totally different picture struct uh, implied picture structures. structures. So I tell you, it helps me decide on one as, rather than another, but then I put it aside. I don't use it again. And most of the time, the uh, image that develops uh, is really quite different uh, from any of the images uh, that I've taken. I started using the camera mostly as a way of recording the fact that I do work with models for, the, uh, uh, for income tax purposes, <laughs> for deductions. You have to, when you get audited, you have to prove it. Your accountant has a vast reserve of these <laughs> But then I thought it was useful. Yeah. But I've never worked from those images. The only, I've done two paintings from uh, photographs, and the first one was of Panofsky because he was already dead, and I wanted to do the painting, the portrait. And, uh, Gosh, I can't remember the other one. Oh, uh, Mrs. Uh, oh, Mrs. Hirschhorn, uh, the, the museum or her husband or she had their birthday celebrated about three years ago. Oh, she had her 90th birthday party and it was given in honor of her at the museum. And she was down in Florida and I was in New York, and there was no way the two of us could get together in the short period of time. 
and I was asked to do this painting again to be used as a, as a poster. And so I was sent a group of photographs to work from. But I really had no idea what she actually looked like as I was doing the painting. And I was, the one I picked was the one that looked like it was least, caught her at the most casual kind of moment. And uh, I was relieved to find when I actually met her at the uh, celebration of her birthday that the painting did look like her. <laughs> Not nearly as relieved as she was. <laughs> But other than that, I, I've not worked from photographs. I'm curious about one thing. Um, what I'm hearing you say is you set up the, the composition, you set up the toys and the model in the way you're going to paint them, and then you find somewhere to stand, and you have your easel in front of you, and you start in the middle, and you work out. But like, for example, on this painting, if you move your head an inch or two, the relationship of the mass to the bodies are all going to change. How, right. how do you find, do you, do you have a way to stand in exactly the same space well, or do you have a way of dealing with that? Yeah, I use, uh, mark all the positions of the models and me with tape on the floor or on the, where the models are on the cloth, whatever where the models are and we get back into the same positions as close as possible. But uh, like but, if you're working... But everything does keep swimming around. It does, okay, yeah. Uh, can't get rid of it entirely, except moment by moment. And that's what the painting ends up being, a collection of moments within that framework that's established at the beginning. Thanks. But the light is always the same. Uh, controlled light. That was another thing Mercedes didn't like about my work. I used strong artificial light uh, in fixed positions. Her ideal was a studio in late afternoon without artificial light kind of misty and uh, we did speak about that so did you have aesthetic arguments about these things oh. as a group well the aesthetic arguments have mostly been about being a realist it's not it's uh the rest of the art world seems to make it very difficult for realist painters <laughs> It's interesting. It's been an interesting uh, kind of ongoing discussion, sometimes quite vehement. I won't name names. <laughs> but with some people who I knew as students, even. Yes? This could be a little personal, but back in 65, when I first became your student, um, I remember you talking about Fellini then and Juliet of the Spirits. And I never, I walked away from there never having a complete thought about why that was mentioned or why you were mentioning. And then I always wondered afterwards, who were the people who were influencing you back in the 60s when I was your student? and you know, what was influencing your philosophy well, as a painter? In the 60s, I was trying to avoid all influence. The one thing I didn't want to do was to make it look like an art historical oriented exercise. And I didn't want to make it look like an illustration. And those were two difficult things to bypass. Uh, but it's one of the critical things when I, when the composition is first set up, 
I would like it not to look like anything I can immediately think of in an art history survey course. And in, and the story, it should not be telling a story other than models posing in the studio. Uh, and when I decided to really explore what I saw rather than what I knew to be there, I decided to try to reinvent realism for myself, to pretend that I'd never seen another realist painting. So there were no influences I could point to other than in terms of overall picture structure. By that time, that was pretty hazy, too. There, yeah. Yes. In context of everything you're saying, how do you see Matisse in terms of this structure of uh, um, uh, formalist values, or looking at the object, or in or interior or oblique references? How do you envision Matisse in, in realm of your own philosophy? Well. The Matisse's I like are the more abstract ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the ones he did in that little apartment that he lived in for such a long time, uh, I really don't care for them so much. They look badly drawn to me. Uh -huh. Not necessarily bad academic drawing, mm -hmm. just, uh, just a, a little careless on his part. And he tightened up. That's when I like them later. You mean in the 20s you're talking about? You liked him in the 20s? I like him later. The, the big paper cutouts. Ah. And then before that, the ones that Diebenkorn liked, mm -hmm. for instance. And the, and the early, really abstracted ones, the dancers and so forth. But that representational stuff looks to me too much like fashion uh -huh. illustration. But fashion illustration was influenced by that by Matisse, mm -hmm. not the other way around. But they're, they're nice, <laughs> but I can't love them. <laughs> there, there was a big Matisse show that was very instructive, not the one that was most recent, but the one about 10 years ago. Uh, where they had a lot of those middle period things. And it looked to me, after doing those great monumental things that are mostly in Russia now, uh, it looked like he had a nervous breakdown and went back to something not, not monumental anyway. And then he came out of it. was how have all the years of modeling influenced my own work as an artist? Well, I mean, I, I, a, a number of responses, I guess. I, um, in some respects, I feel like I haven't taken on yet the subject matter of being a model, and that is something I will take on in the next couple of years, because I have been pretty systematically working my way through all the genres of art making, of painting. Um, right now I'm at still life, sort of, but, but using language only. Um, so probably I'll take on the Odalisque next. Um, but then the other thing that someone observed to me recently was that um, how many animals figure in my work, and they thought that was the influence of Philip, which I thought was so wonderful because I, I never thought of that before. I just I'm very much an outdoor person, and I really love nature and animals, and I love drawing from life, although I'm not a realist in any way. Um, but I thought that was a wonderful observation that um, that we both do have all the animals, and I would also say just. Um, 
for me as an art student in high school, um, you know, the, the, the pearl scenes from the 60s and 70s were the paintings that made me want to become a painter. I can still remember the first time I saw those images and how shocking and stunning they were and that it was possible to address the figure in that way, that anti-romantic, anti-idealist way it was incredibly liberating to me as an artist who, or not even yet an artist, but as a, as a student who was growing up in a household of abstract expressionist painters, I, I should confess. <laughs> Both my, painter, my parents um, were abstract expressionist painters, and my own inclina inclinations were more toward observation, and um, so I, it was tremendously exciting for me to discover Philip's work. Yeah. Uh, w one of the things that's in is interested me about getting and in getting involved in realism again has been watching uh, a few of my contemporaries who also were realists watching their development as artists. And we've all done it in the face of modernism. And I think that's terribly important because we're all smart enough to have been able to work in any direction we chose. And somehow we chose to go into this other, this other branch uh, and still think in terms of modernist, uh, that's the wrong word, I guess, uh, of being educated by the early modernists of the uh, 20th century, which you can't dismiss. You know, it's, it's in there. I think uh, it's been very fascinating to watch my contemporary realists uh, grow. And it's been interesting also that we've had the ability to have such long careers uh, to see what happens when you work an idea into the ground, in a, in a sense. <laughs> we have one more. One more question. This will be the last question. Uh, I just had a simple question about, could you explain that the very first painting, it's actually a story that I know, but I wonder if you could tell it again in this context of the, the, that very first painting or one of the two that won the Scholastic Art Prize, the, the one with the, the merry-go-round? The merry-go-round? The carousel painting. Oh, the we carousel. Have, we don't have an image of it. We don't have an image of it here. But one of the two paintings I did in high school that won the National Scholastic High School Contest. And I should say that one of the jurors that year was Reginald Marsh. And my painting was a painting of a, a carousel done from memory. But it was of an actual carousel in Pittsburgh. The other painting, which does relate to what I'm doing now in a curious way, uh, was of a, a barber shop in the black neighborhood that I lived in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, the clientele is all black, and the, the barber's foot is very big, and the spittoon in the foreground is very large. And on the back, in the background, there's a mirror with some posters that show uh, Lucky Tiger, whatever Lucky Tiger was, with this head of a tiger on it, and the light fixtures. It has a lot of the elements that I've used now in it. And I guess the carousel had a lot of the animals. Because actually, I did a painting with Desiree and another young lady uh, in it with a group of those horse figures going around in a circle mm -hmm. around them. Mm -hmm. And the other girl, Patty, when they looked at this early painting and the painting she was posing in and said, boy, you really haven't gone very far, have you? <laughs> <laughs> there was about 60 years difference at that point. <laughs> Thank you very much.